This program is brought to you by Emory University. Okay. <laughs> okay. If everybody's ready, uh, we're behind schedule, but frankly, we're not surprised. <laughs> uh, speech is free at all of these symposia, not just about First Amendment, and they all run over time. So we have our final panel. I think it's going to be a really good one. Uh, there's some common themes in what all of our folks are saying. Some of them are things that you've already heard and several of the things already today, which is the doctrine's a mess. And it's kind of an Elizabeth Barrett Browning, how much is it a mess? Let me count the ways. Well, we've been counting the ways. Three of our four speakers are going to count the ways a little bit more. And our final speaker is going to make a general sort of meta point about the whole business. Our speakers today, uh, starting with on my right, is uh, Caroline Corbin, who is a teacher of First Amendment and con law at the University of Miami School of Law. Uh, next to Caroline is David Hahn. David is a professor at Pepperdine University School of Law, also teaches in this area. Uh, Next to David is someone who's not a law professor, he's a real lawyer, like to gender, who argues these cases. He's done something like 14 cases, arguments before the Supreme Court, winning a disgustingly large number of them for those of us who still would like to argue one. He works with the American Center for Law and Justice. And, our, and finally, all the way over to, our far, to my far right, not necessarily ideologically, uh, is Derek uh, Baumbauer, who is a professor of intellectual property and First Amendment at the University of Arizona College of Law. Uh, our order of our speakers, Derek will speak first, Caroline will speak second, Jay third, and then David will wrap it up. Um, so, Derek? Oh, pardon me, let me say one other thing. I was told by some folks during the break that guys in the back have sometimes had a hard time hearing because we're not talking into the microphones. Don't be shy. If you can't hear, do something. We want to be heard. It's free speech. Welcome back from break. So first, um, thanks so much to the Law Review, to Gerard, and to Alex for inviting me to this uh, terrific event. And thanks to my co-panelists and to all of you um, for your thoughts on my project. So um, as an intellectual property and cyber law guy, um, I feel a certain and distinct level of fear in attempting a First Amendment paper in the midst of so many experts. But I'm hopeful that my atypical, perhaps slightly weird perspective can help shed some new light on free speech debates. It turns out that copyright and free speech share a challenge, the shift to networked and pervasively indexed digital information stores. For copyright, the difficulty is adjudicating claims over ownership and use of data against the backdrop of a legal regime founded on assumptions of costly copying and dissemination. For First Amendment doctrine, the conundrum is deciding among the competing demands of speakers, audience, and regulators when legal regimes from securities transactions to prescription drug rules to cybersecurity depend upon controls over information flow. This technological and economic shift in the information ecosystem has generated bitter legal conflicts over prescription data, internet transmission of broadcast television, algorithmically produced predictions, and regulation of psychiatric and medical practice, among many others. My project argues that we can help resolve contentious free speech issues, counterintuitively, by looking to copyright doctrine, which is a reversal of the usual pattern of constitutional borrowing here. And so I'm going to briefly make three core claims. First, with few exceptions, expression that is eligible for copyright protection is and ought to be treated as speech guarded by the First Amendment. Second, because these two doctrines share closely related motivations, the zones where their decisions diverge offer useful insights. And third, a copyright-based approach to speech generates surprising yet helpful conclusions about several tricky First Amendment problems. So the elevator pitch version of the first claim is that copyright equals speech. And the critical linkage here is copyright's authorship requirement. The US Constitution empowers Congress to grant copyrights only to authors. And the Copyright Act limits its entitlements to works of authorship. 
the types or categories of eligible works have expanded gradually but inexorably over time, including to somewhat controversial areas such as photography. Until the Supreme Court decided Burrough-Giles versus Donaldson lithography in 1844, a case about copying a famous portrait of Oscar Wilde, it was not plain that the camera work involved had sufficient creativity, sufficient authorship to qualify for copyright protection. Since that time, in 1844, nearly all expressive works within copyrightable subject matter categories have been determined to include enough authorial contribution to gain the benefits of the law. The works are the end product of human creative labors, which is why they also constitute free speech for First Amendment purposes. Even software code, impenetrable to most people, constitutes a creative work that expresses the ideas of its programmers. And if we look at it, the two doctrines also share common purposes, such as driving the creation and dissemination of information. And doctrinally, they also share some common features, such as judicial reluctance to engage in normative analysis of content and a default preference for more rather than less information. We see from the cases, the Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized this unity of purpose, in particular when seeking to reconcile conflicts between the areas. So I argue this makes copyright a natural tool to apply to First Amendment problems. And put simply, where we find authorship, we should expect to find speech. Now to be clear, this is not an exercise in sorting protected speech among the various tiers of scrutiny. There will be copyrighted expression at both the edge and the core of First Amendment protection. Rather, this methodology's task is to determine whether, in Tony Massaro's words, expression of issues falls above or below the line that demarcates speech from non-speech. Determining the level of scrutiny or protection uh, work receives is a really hard task which I am content to leave to experts like David, Caroline, and Jay. So I think that we can usefully map copyright versus free speech protection with some interesting results. And I hope, as you'll see, generally speaking, I think that the two doctrines are coterminous. In fairness, this chart, admittedly somewhat simplified, um, does include some hard problems, such as the now famous monkey selfie, which does not copyright for, which does not qualify for copyright, and which might not count as speech. Um, <laughs> the hard part is knowing I have just been upstaged by a monkey. Okay, so. If, in fact, this is true, then my claim offers um, some considerable benefits as a first-cut test for the First Amendment. Where we find a work of authorship, we can conclude initially that it is protected as speech. And helpfully, it's not even necessary to determine who the author is, only that there is one, as in cases with anonymous speech. Now, you still need to consider the upper left quadrant, right, which includes copyright-eligible works that are generally not covered by the First Amendment. And to be clear, this is not the end of the story as regards government regulation of that speech. There's plenty of copyrightable expression um, that's subject to regulation as commercial speech, or for national security reasons, or because the government is actually able to carry the weighty burden of review under strict scrutiny. I think that the interesting parts of this map, though, are where the doctrines diverge. So, I think that the tension between the two is largely illusory where copyright extends protection, but the First Amendment withholds it. So it turns out that copyright does relatively little utilitarian work to bolster the production of non-speech works when um, taking advantage of its entitlements, such as copying or disseminating or publicly performing those works um, risks criminal or civil liability. My guess is that few authors are likely to assert copyright protection against infringers of their child pornography. Um, and it turns out that distributors and publishers will be wary of making defamatory content widely available. It's possible, in fairness, that copyright does some expressive work here by recognizing an author as such. And I think it also usefully sets the default rule for my methodology. The burden rests upon the government to prove that a work falls into one of the unprotected zones rather than upon the author to demonstrate protection. The challenging quadrant is where expression is ineligible for copyright protection, but nonetheless is safeguarded by the First Amendment. Here, to be candid, the copyright methodology is simply incomplete. 
it's a poor predictor. Um, that's inevitable, perhaps. All theories of the First Amendment are incomplete. We could improve the fit somewhat by considering the prudential exclusions from copyright, works that Congress could protect but has elected not to for policy reasons, such as pre-1972 sound recordings or original contributions to unauthorized derivative works. The difficult part is that that necessarily entails some level of conjecture by courts and scholars who would have to probe the theoretical boundaries of the IP clause rather than looking to the far more specific terms of the Copyright Act. And sadly, it doesn't help us at all with unprotected expressions such as facts, ideas, and unfixed works that is at the heart of First Amendment canon. And I would argue that for these works, copyright and the First Amendment share the same goals, but their different mechanisms lead to divergent results. Copyright denies protection to facts and ideas to increase their usage in discourse by making them costless to all authors. The First Amendment protects them from government regulation to make this information similarly costless. And thus, this zone of tension or perhaps outright contradiction, I think is a vital reminder that copyright law, too, operates as a governmental restriction on speech and must occasionally yield. Overall, though, I would say that for the most part, copyright's authorship requirement makes it an excellent guide to First Amendment speech identification. OK. so. Turns out that copyright equals speech has some surprising implications. First, it makes the Supreme Court's controversial decisions recently in Citizens United and McCutcheon seem less like tectonic shifts and more like logical implications of existing doctrine. If one accepts, even just for the sake of argument, that restrictions on financial expenditures in political campaigns implicate the First Amendment, then the extension of those protections to non-human entities looks unexceptional. Copyright law has long conferred authorship status directly on non-human authors, even when humans physically produce the relevant expression. So copyright's recognition of non-human entities, as with author interests, predates the analogous First Amendment recognition by over 70 years. So for example, under the current 1976 Copyright Act, the work for hire provisions confer copyright upon the employer when an employee creates a work of authorship within the scope of her employment, or upon a hiring party, such as a nonprofit organization, when that entity enters into an agreement with a human contractor for certain works. And similarly, juridical persons are capable of being co authors with human ones under the right circumstances. So for the IP nerds in the crowd, right, this is not an issue of a transfer or a license. The non-human entity is the author from the start. So it seems less discordant for a corporation to be a speaker for political reasons or purposes if it's already capable of being an author for copyright ones. So for both copyright and First Amendment purposes, the, copy the corporation naturally has to operate through agents. But we don't attribute that speech to them. Right? So whatever he says in character, Robert Downey Jr. is not Iron Man. And Jamie Dimon speaks for J.P. Morgan Chase and not for himself. So thus, I think that copyright helps to explain and perhaps normalize what appear, at first glance, to be radical shifts in First Amendment thinking. Second, I think that a copyright-based approach may help to reduce what I call technological exceptionalism in free speech law. So copyright has struggled repeatedly with the combination of technological tools and human authors, and with the question of whether eventually the tool so predominates as to crowd out human authorship. We see this with both photographs and computer code. In the 19th century, scholars and courts frequently agreed that photographs were mere representations of the natural world with scant or no authorial creativity, hence ineligible for copyright. The Supreme Court settles the matter in 1884 in favor of eligibility, although the rationale is a little rough around the edges. Um, and similarly, before 1980, courts and scholars struggled with how to treat software code. It's a language that's written by humans but is intended for consumption by machines. Here, Congress clarifies the statutory issue with a minor tweak to the Copyright Act in 1980, but that alteration still requires that the legislature remain within the Constitution's limits 
regarding authorship and copyright. So from a copyright perspective, both code and cameras come to the same conclusion. The expressive output of human interaction with machines enjoys protection. And yet today, we see many of these same debates repeated in First Amendment circles. So the current fight uh, centers around search engine results, um, particularly Google, although it can be extended, I think, to algorithmic output more generally. So we've got a hotly contested debate over whether Google search results constitute speech. You have scholars such as Oren Bracca and Tim Wu who say no, um, Jane and Eugene who say yes, James Grimmelman treading carefully the middle path saying maybe, um, and I would argue that copyright presses towards Jane and Eugene's position. So again, algorithmic speech is not immune from regulation, such as by the FTC or the FCC, but neither is it beef jerky where regulators need take no note of the First Amendment. So to conclude, I argue that copyright and the First Amendment are normally fellow travelers. Where one doctrine confers protection upon an author or speaker, the other does so as well. And I want to close by suggesting that, these that using these doctrines, this pair of doctrines, as lenses through which to understand one another is a natural result of the challenge that I opened with, the rise of the networked information economy. America increasingly produces bits rather than things. People and corporations will contest ownership rights over those ones and zeros, and government restrictions on the creation, distribution, and use of information will inevitably create tensions with free speech protections. For good or for ill, the digital network ecosystem puts pressure on both copyright and the First Amendment doctrine to expand their roles. Thank you again for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your feedback. have to lower it. Okay. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, and I do want to thank everyone who made it possible um, for me to be here. So is gay conversion therapy speech or conduct? What about standing in front of an abortion clinic or refusing to bake a cake? Today, I'm going to be presenting the very beginning of a paper on speech versus conduct. And because I'm only starting the project, I will have more questions than answers. Um, but hopefully, you'll find the questions interesting. So we all know that the free speech clause protects speech and not conduct. And that classification can be dispositive. If a law regulates pure conduct, it doesn't trigger any heightened scrutiny under the free speech clause. If a law regulates pure speech, on the other hand, it may well be subject to the strictest form of scrutiny. It sounds straightforward. Of course, it's not. Right? First, sometimes a law that seems to regulate speech is treated as regulating conduct. Sometimes a law that seems to regulate conduct is treated as regulating speech. And third, sometimes the law is regulating expressive conduct. That is, conduct that has an expressive message. So I'm going to start by providing an example or two of each of those. And then I'm going to examine in a little more depth the last category, that of expressive conduct. And I'm going to do that in the context of baking cakes. Right? And I'm hoping to try and identify some factors that might help us identify, uh, that might help us decide difficult cases. All right, so the first sort of speech versus conduct puzzle is when speech is equated to conduct. Again, the consequences of this equation is that any regulation of conduct generally only has to pass rational review. So one example is Title VII's ban on sexual harassment in the workplace. Right? Verbal comments alone may create a hostile work environment in violation of Title VII. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court has characterized the speech as conduct, namely the conduct of discrimination. Another example is doctors' conversations with their patients. With abortion, lower courts have taken sort of different approaches to mandatory abortion counseling 
Like the uh, example mentioned earlier, the requirement that doctors show and describe an ultrasound of an unwanted pregnancy to a woman seeking to abort it. And the Fifth Circuit viewed this informed consent requirement as essentially regulating conduct, namely the practice of medicine. In contrast, the Fourth Circuit held that these mandatory ultrasound laws clearly implicate doctors' free speech rights, as well as the regulation of the medical profession, and applied intermediate scrutiny. You see a similar divide with courts addressing laws banning so-called gay conversion therapy. These laws forbid licensed therapists from subjecting minors to the harmful gay conversion therapy. And the Ninth Circuit held that the practice of therapy, even talking therapy, is the practice of medicine, and therefore conduct this does not trigger any free speech scrutiny. And in contrast, the New Jersey court subjected one of these bans to intermediate scrutiny. And so those cases sort of present the problem of speech treated like conduct, but sometimes the reverse happens as well when a court seems to treat conduct like speech. And I think the most recent example was from McCullen versus Coakley. That was the abortion buffer zone case. Right? In that case, anti-abortion counselors challenged a Massachusetts law which made it a crime to sort of stand to be within 35 feet of an entrance of a clinic that performed abortions. Right? On its face, speech is nowhere to be seen. Right? This is not a time, place, and manner regulation of speech, since it's not regulating speech. It's regulating where you can stand. Right? Nor is it a content-neutral regulation of expressive conduct, since the argument was not made that standing in itself is expressive. Um, rather, it's a time, place, and manner regulation of conduct that incidentally affects speech, because the conduct was a necessary precondition of the speech, which was the one-on-one -on -one counseling that the anti-abortion protesters wanted to do. Nonetheless, at no point did the Supreme Court really seem to consider that it might just be a regulation of conduct, something that generally does not trigger free speech analysis, even if it has an incidental effect on it. Instead, it treated the regulation of conduct, or what seemed conduct, as a regulation of speech, a content-neutral one, to be sure, but a speech regulation. And then there's expressive conduct. Right? Classic examples of conduct that have a, a message to them includes burning things, um, burning draft cars, burning bras, burning flags, burning crosses. Right? Current potential examples seem to focus more on baking than burning. Um, in particular, there have been a spate of cases involving bakery owners who have refused to bake a cake. Right? Some religious bakers don't want to provide cakes for same-sex weddings. And they have challenged public accommodation laws that ban discrimination on the basis of its sexual orientation for requiring them to do so. And they've challenged them on religious grounds and speech grounds. I'm going to focus on the speech grounds. And for our speech purposes, the question is, does refusing to bake a cake amount to expressive conduct that triggers free speech protection? Right? Do bakers have a valid compelled speech claim if they have to bake a cake? Now, these wedding cakes are not the only skirmishes in the cake wars. Um, recently, a baker refused to make a cake for a religious customer. Right? The Christian customer wanted a Bible-shaped cake with the phrase, God hates gays on it. And while the baker was willing to make the Bible-shaped cake, um, she refused to write the requested message on it. So how should we think about these cake refusals? And how do they compare to other refusals, like refusing to photograph a same-sex wedding or refusing to sell sheets to a same-sex couple? Um, so the existing doctrinal test for deciding what counts as expressive conduct is from Spence v. Washington. And conduct is generally considered protected expressive conduct if first, the speaker intended to send a particularized message, and second, her audience understood that message. And it's not clear how the refusals come out under that test. Every refuser intends to send a particular message, namely, I disapprove, 
Um, the question is, how do we read that refusal? Now, the religious bakers would, might argue that their message of non-endorsement and disapproval of same-sex unions is well understood by those denied a wedding cake or wedding photographs. The, it raises the question, does that mean every refusal, including, say, refusals to sell sheets to gay couples, amount to expressive conduct giving rise to a compelled speech claim? So I thought perhaps by comparing various refusals, refusals, we might be able to tease out some distinctions that matter as we try and derive some guidelines for expressive conduct. So starting with a comparison between the wedding cake and the hate cake. Um, one non-speech distinction is that refusing to write God hates gays doesn't actually violate any Colorado laws. Right, the baker opposed the message not because the people requesting it were Christian, but because the message was hateful, literally. Um, but setting that aside, the two refusals are not the same. Right? The wedding cake baker refused to bake a cake at all. The hate cake baker was willing to make the cake, but refused to write a particular message on it. Thus, her refusal was not really about baking cakes, but about writing words, and thus arguably presents a fairly straightforward speech case. In other words, one major consideration may be whether the refusal involves words, right? Although, then again, if you think, if, if we're going to say words always equal speech, that may preclude the possibility that sometimes speech is actually better understood as conduct, and is this the right result? Should we re treat a refusal to, say, photocopy a wedding invitation in the same way as a refusal to write, God hates gays? Yeah, I don't have an answer to that yet. Um, but words seem to matter. OK, how about comparing the sale of a wedding cake with the sale of wedding sheets? Right? Is selling sheets expressive? If so, exactly what does it express? Right? Now, if I'm the sheet seller, I might argue that helping a same-sex relationship by selling them sheets for their wedding bed where they're going to have sex right, is tantamount to endorsing it, and I don't want to be compelled to endorse that. It's sort of similar to the religious bakers' claims about their wedding cakes. Um, but generally, when you sell something to someone in a store, that doesn't carry any message of endorsement. Right? The social meaning of a sale is limited. Right? It generally carries no connotation of endorsing the customers or their events. In other words, a sale for money in a place of public accommodation does not seem to be expressive conduct. Well, if selling sheets conveys no message of endorsement, then why should selling cakes or flowers or photographs? All right, well, one difference is that the baker creates what she sells, while I, the sheet, sell, uh, the, the sheet store owner, do not. Right? So maybe the expressive component lies in the creation rather than the sale. All right, but assume that I own the factory that makes the sheets. Right? It's not clear that production really changes anything. All right, so maybe it's not the creation. Maybe it's the artistry. Okay, so imagine now that I needlepoint, I needlepoint, I needlepoint stunning borders on the sheets. Like I basically make the most exquisite sheets in the area, right? Even if I make them by hand with undeniable artistry, and I mean these are awesome sheets, right? It's not clear what's communicated. Right? Making and selling artistic sheets for sale doesn't seem to endorse same-sex marriage all that more than making and selling ordinary sheets. Now, I'm not trying to make a high art, low art distinction where high art is expressive and low arts and crafts are not. I find that problematic for various reasons, among which this binary is often gendered. Instead, I think that it's a distinction that might be playing a role here is that the creative artistry does not in any way further a message of endorsement. Right? There doesn't seem to be a link between the creativity behind my embroidery or baking and endorsement of same-sex marriage. Right? Again, assuming that might be something expressed, it's not approval of same-sex marriage. 
So thinking about conduct versus speech in the context of these refusals, it seems like refusal to conduct a commercial transaction is ultimately conduct. And the sale of an item, even one created with genuine artistry, does not equate to compelled endorsement of the customer or her event, unless maybe there's, maybe there's something in the artistry itself that expresses a message of endorsement. Which brings us to the question of wedding cakes versus wedding photography, right? Because there's no gainsaying the artistry involved in taking a picture, right? The timing, the light, the composition, all these creative decisions make an impact on the message of the final image. So the question may be, again, I have questions, um, is, there, is there a link between the artistic components and a message of endorsement of same-sex unions? So again, right, recall that the link between writing God hates gays and a message of condemnation of gay people is clear. The link between taking pictures of a same-sex wedding and a message of approval of same-sex marriage is not quite as obvious. You know, may maybe, maybe it is there, um, right? As anyone who's had their picture taken while eating something, right, artistic decisions can influence the message conveyed by a photograph. Okay, um, assuming there is a link, Right, this is this is me thinking through this. Right? Assuming there is a link, is there a link? Is a link enough such that taking an artistic, positive photograph and event should be read as an endorsement of that event? Right? Because again, their concern is they're being forced to put their stamp of approval on something that they completely disagree with. Um, so, is there enough of a link between taking an artistic, positive photograph? Right? Should that be read as an endorsement? Well, let's think, why might it not be? And again, more questions. Maybe it has something to do with whether that aspect predominates, right? Maybe the artistic choices that translate into endorsement have to predominate. And I don't know if that's the case with wedding photography or not. Uh, maybe it has something to do with the commercial context, right? This was certainly decisive for the New Mexico Supreme Court in deciding a case involving a wedding photographer, and they said, no, there's no expressive component. Um, so if you think, um, like with the, with Ten Commandments, right, in, in sort of the Establishment Clause context, just as the Supreme Court has held that erecting a Ten Commandments, uh, erecting a sort of a Ten Commandments monument doesn't read as endorsing religion in all contexts, right? It makes a difference whether you erect a giant monument in the middle of your courthouse versus having a monument in a museum surrounded by lots of other monuments, right? The context matters. Um, so maybe the context of wedding photography matters, the commercial context, so that taking a picture of a same-sex wedding should not be read as endorsing it in the context of a hired photography studio that is a place of public accommodation. So under this view, right, if a, if a married man and his mistress right, go to Sears and get their photo taken, giving each other a big smackaroo, right, we don't necessarily read Sears of the photographer as endorsing adultery, right, partly because of the commercial context. All right, so again, just questions on, on whether they're really, it really we should consider this expressive conduct entitled to free speech protection. Well, one question you might ask is, well, why not just treat it as speech, right? Why not err on the side of speech and subject these regulations to intermediate scrutiny, which is what you submit expressive conduct to, right? Intermediate scrutiny is so elastic, it's not necessarily gonna change the outcome in all that many cases, right? Again even if baking a cake were expressive conduct, the baker's claim could easily fail. Um, the state is not just an important interest, but a compelling interest in ending discrimination. Every time the state permits a baker or shopkeeper or photographer to essentially hang a no gaze allowed sign, it creates significant harms, right? It denies access to services, and it denies equal citizenship, right? And there's really no other way to guarantee full access to services and equal citizenship unless you bar these refusals. Um, 
So true, it, the, it, the court might be forced to directly address the clash between the constitutional values uh, and sort of force it to be more transparent in what it's protecting. Um, but you know, why not, why not just let them go through that, right? There are advantages. Um, I want to resist the impulse a little bit, mostly because I, I think we tend to overvalue free speech rights. I would even say sometimes we fetishize them a little bit. And that overvaluing regularly comes at the expense of equality. Right? And I don't want to just assume it's expressive conduct because I don't want to add sort of another thumb to that scale. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having this symposium. So it appears that the question of the day is to bake or not to bake, that is the question. It's interesting that those cases in that context present these difficult legal issues. Because it's not so difficult in a, just a pure analysis if you were to not have a baker or a photographer and you were to take it out of the debate over same-sex marriage or sexual orientation, whatever it might be, and put it into another context. And that would be a context, for instance, where you had an African-American owned dry cleaner. And in comes the leader of the local Ku Klux Klan and says, I'd like you to dry clean and press my sheets. <laughs> I suspect that we would find that you should not be able to compel that dry cleaner to engage in that practice. A kosher butcher, if the United States decided to pass a law that said pork is the healthy meat, all butcher shops must sell pork, that we're going to compel a kosher butcher to do work, if you will, whatever you would call it, butcher. <laughs> cut and slice the pork. These are not easy questions. And, and this is pick your poison, because the alternatives on both of these are not so great. I, I tend to take a view that standing in front of a place of business or an, an organization you disagree with, the process of standing itself is speech. And I don't think speech always has to be a, a spoken word. But things are so complicated today. I remember the good old days of the 1980s when you'd have cases like this. No free speech activities inside the airport at Los Angeles Airport. Those were easy cases. So I had that case. And it was a ban on speech activity inside the airports. And all nine justices of the Supreme Court, uh, it was an opinion actually written by Justice O'Connor, it said, no conceivable governmental interest would justify such a sweeping prohibition of speech. Compare that 1987 decision to just a few years ago, where on the very same day, you mentioned the uh, Ten Commandment cases. On the very same day, the court issued two opinions on Ten Commandment cases. They were OK if they were outside in Texas. They were not OK if they were inside in Kentucky. And then I had the, I had the third, the trilogy of the Ten Commandments cases in a case called Summum versus Pleasant Grove. So I represented this small town in Utah that had a Ten Commandment monument. The one that's very similar to these ones you see in a lot of towns throughout the country, placed there by the Fraternal Order of Eagles. But not really. I had the question at the oral argument about what's the secular purpose of the Ten Commandments monument. The truth of the matter is, and this is a true story, that those monuments were placed there because of an advertising ploy by a movie that was going on at the very same time in the 1950s called The Ten Commandments. <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille, funded, and actually sent out the stars of the movie to these dedications. Now, I had this case, and it was interesting because it was a situation where you, it was not the typical Establishment Clause case, where you had a challenge at the allowing the monument to be in the area as a violation of the Establishment Clause. There was another group, uh, and this was the Summum religion, and they had, you know, the, the Fraternal Order of Eagles had the Ten Commandments, they had the seven aphorisms. So they wanted the city to put in their park the seven aphorisms. And the city said, well, no, you know, 
there's not an establishment clause case here. They didn't, they, because they certainly didn't want an establishment clause case because then they would have been concerned their monument wouldn't be up either. So they char challenged it basically on a public forum free speech case. And I've argued a lot of public forum free speech case, but there is a real difference between government speech and private speech. I mean, when the, when the government is speaking, the government could take a position. We could disagree with it. We have the right to say we do, but the government can choose its message, for instance. I use two examples, one of which I was really proud of, the other one which worked out fine. But you had the, the Statue of Liberty was a gift from the people of France to the United States. The government takes it, places it there on, on uh, Liberty Ireland, and there you have it. Do, now does the government have to take the Statue of Tyranny because some anarchist group says, we think the government's tyrannical, we want the Statue of Tyranny. The, the answer to that is no. But the more creative example was this. I'm a Beatle fan. And um, so when I was preparing for that case, I actually went to uh, Central Park and looked at all of those monuments. And the monument that grabbed me the most was the imagine, I don't know if you've seen this, it's, the, it's from the people of, of Japan to the people of New York City. And it was the um, monument, if you will, it was a, it's a beautiful mosaic to John Lennon. It's called Imagine. It's in Strawberry Fields, the area of, of the park. And um, so I, I made the argument that the city had the right to accept that as government speech, that the city was not now required to accept a monument to say Mark David Chapman, who assassinated John Lennon, because the government's might taking a position. Now, I will say that the case was successful uh, and uh, we won unanimously, but I really wanted to make that uh, oral argument and include the Beatle reference, because I don't think anybody's done a Beatle reference at the Supreme Court of the United States. So as I was walking out the door of our townhouse in Washington, my wife said to me, you know, some of them are octogenarians. They're not going to know what you're talking about. But I did have it in the brief, however. But I will say this. I have the only Supreme Court opinion that I know of that has the entire words to imagine as a footnote in Justice Alito's opinion. <laughs> but those are, e those are easy cases, in a sense. I mean, those are much easier cases. I mean, when I argued uh, a case in, in 1984 in, 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 involving the Equal Access Act that was passed, bipartisan support in 1984, allowing prayer and Bible clubs to meet, the case wound its way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. It was um, a case I argued, and it was this, this clash of speech and establishment clause you, you mentioned. And there is this tension when you have, uh, you know, a free speech claim and a, and that's religious speech, and then the establishment clause issue if it's on government property around government uh, facilities. The court in that one, another opinion actually by Justice O'Connor, said there's this crucial distinction between government speech endorsing religion, which is prohibited by the uh, Establishment Clause, and private speech endorsing religion that is protected by both the Free Speech and Free Exercise Clause. And then she went on to note that, there's, uh, that high school students were mature enough to understand that the school isn't endorsing everything it fails to censor, which goes back to the cake-bake analysis and the whole issue with the photographer is the endorsement issue. So does the, does the, is the baker endorsing a position they disagree with from a free speech perspective just by making the cake? By the way, my answer to baking the cake was I do not want a Supreme Court case that is a cake baking case. So I, I said, which I got criticism from someone on my side of the equation on this one, I, because I said bake the cake in the sense that that is not the case to really determine that issue. Because you do have these competing interests, and it's not clear. And the, and the fact of the matter is, the free speech analysis is a mess. And you mentioned the abortion cases. I argued those, a lot of those, too. And you talk about a mess. So I had one case where a speech, a floating bubble zone, eight justices said was unconstitutional. And it was a stand in the zone. So it was a speech case. And no speaking without consent court said that was unconstitutional. Then I had another case that wasn't an injunction but was a statute with basically the same zone, Hill versus Colorado. That didn't end up so well for my client because there they said, oh no, that was okay because in determining content-based discrimination, and I like quoting from the opinion because I don't want to misquote it, and it's, it's come up and it created some real havoc in the, in the lower courts. This is what the court said in Hill versus Colorado. The principal inquiry in determining content neutrality is whether the government has adopted a regulation of speech because of disagreement with the message it conveys. But that's actually the test for viewpoint discrimination. So in other words, if a, if, if a government were to pass a policy that said, we are not going to allow a uh, same-sex couple to have access to certain rights, benefits, publications, 
that's an, that's an easy case. There's no compelling governmental interest for that. They can't do that viewpoint-based discrimination. If students want to uh, conduct a, a pro-war rally, uh, and then there's another group that wants the anti-war rally, the school can't say, well, we're going to let the pro-war rally in, but not the anti-war rally. That's not content. That's viewpoint. But it got murky after Hill. And it has continued to be a mess. The, the court most recently uh, decided a case in 2013. And in that particular case, uh, the court held without, it was, a, it was another abortion protest case, McCollum versus Coakley, as was mentioned earlier. And here, the court did not discuss Hill, although similar kind of analysis would have gone on, and said it was content-based. So you've got complete, utter confusion in the existing First Amendment doctrine. Add a Baker case to it, and I don't know what that mix is going to look like, but I suspect not so great. And I think we have to be careful. Um, when the court's very particular, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a, a good practice, to not decide a case on a global basis or a global for the, United States, you know, for the United States. The cases have facts. Facts matter, even in Supreme Court cases. Yes, a precedent's being established. But if you took the example that I gave of the owner of the dry cleaner, you look at it very differently. So we have to make sure we're not looking at these cases through a lens that is cloudy. I tend to side on the more speech, the better. Robust, uninhibited speech contained and controlled by other speech that may be just as robust and just as aggressive. Now, I'm not talking about physical contact. I'm talking about speech. Because we say those abortion protesters were really aggravating and people's blood pressure were going up. And, you know, you could have said the same thing about the labor protesters, too, which had the same degrees or more, more, even in a lot of those cases. Or look at the early civil rights cases, the protest cases there. I mean, this was aggressive speech that was emotional, but we don't want to silence the speech. The question is, and this is the question I always ask myself when I have a case, I had the... Um, I had the Lamb's Chapel case at the Supreme Court of the United States. That was a, the good, another good old days case because the uh, city of St. Mauritius, New York School District decided to have a policy where they allowed every conceivable group to ask, have access to their school facilities except for one, Lamb's Chapel's church. They even allowed another religious group in there. It was the Southern Gospel Harmonizers were able to have a concert there, but not Lamb's Chapel Church because they were showing a film se series on family issues and... The school district could already allow other groups to discuss family issues, and there was this position that the state of New York advocated. And this is where I, I think, again, we've got to be careful. Here's what the state of New York said in their briefs and at the oral argument. That religious advocacy only serves the adherence of that particular faith and is of no advantage to the community at large. That was the position of the state of New York, which, fortunately for me, Justice Scalia asked the lawyer for the state of New York, now you wrote in your brief, that religious advocacy doesn't serve the general community interest, only serves the adherence of that particular faith. And then he, these are his words, not mine, so don't, you know, don't, don't, this is his words. He said, it used to be thought. And he said, doesn't New York still give religious exemptions or tax exemptions for religious organizations? Lawyer said, yes. I knew this was, I've had the left hook on me, believe me, so I knew this, he was about to get left hook. And he said, yes, they do. And he said, and then Justice Scalia said this. It used to be thought that religious people were less likely to Mug me or rape my sister. These are Justice Scalia's world, words. Then he said, how's the new regime doing? And that's because there was this view in the lower courts that religious speech, religious advocacy, really could be held to a lower standard. And to, I, I've spent a long time arguing that's not the case. But the reality is, when you combine the complex nature of a case involving speech maybe speech you don't want to hear, and, and conduct, the, the verse on the cake. I mean, I can't imagine compelling the baker to do that. Could you compel the baker to put on there, if they were a Jewish baker, I hate Jews, or Hitler was right? No. So I don't think, the, some of these I think we tend to make more complicated than they are. But if you, if you strip away the emotion and look at it from a free speech standpoint, some of the early decisions a long time ago, they sound like, they're not that long ago, from the 80s, makes sense. If it's content-based discrimination, what is the justification for that content-based discrimination? If it's viewpoint discrimination, there's not a justification for that, unless the government's the speaker. And that's a different scenario, because that's a different set of principles.
So I think we have to be careful to cabin the issues in such a way that we do not do further harm and damage to the existing mess we're already in under the First Amendment. And it is confusing. The principal inquiry test in content-based discrimination, I mean, think about it from a speech perspective. The principal inquiry, this is not a racial animus case. This isn't a gender animus case. This isn't uh, a 1985 three the old Ku Klux Klan Act case, this is a speech case. If the city adopted the regulation with animus, that's viewpoint-based. But why would that affect content? So there's a case up at the Supreme Court right now, it's just argued. Uh, Reed versus the town of Gilbert uh, in Arizona. And there they have a sign ordinance. So the sign ordinance, and a lot of cities have this. So they allow all kinds of signs. You can have political signs, you can have ideological signs, you can have directional signs. So this small church in Arizona has this directional sign. And it has, you know, the church service meets here, but they also have it on their website, and it says your church in the community, and it's, so it's got a message on it as well. But if you're a directional sign, you can only be up 24 hours before and 24 hours afterwards. And the idea is preventing clutter. If you're a political sign, however, you can stay up for six months, and your sign can be literally 10 times larger. Now, your first sympathy may be, hey, who wants all these directional signs up? Well, you could ban all kind of signs. You can ban signage. Yeah, you'd have to come up with governmental interest to justify it, and that would be tough. But why would you be able to handle a directional sign that also has a message? So it's, it's, if you want to look at it as conduct, move this way, go over here to the church meeting. But it's not simply that. There's also a message on it. So the question the Supreme Court's wrestling with is, is it content-based? Because if it's the, the Ninth Circuit held it was content neutral. Now, I will tell you this. I've had this experience at the Ninth Circuit twice um, in the last, I've had it more than twice. But generally, if the Ninth Circuit rule, and this is no offense to anybody from the Ninth Circuit, but generally, if you want it the Ninth Circuit, prepare yourself. And I've had that happen. I, I had a case that we had won in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and there were two decisions issued that very day that I argued the case. Both of them reversed the Ninth Circuit unanimously. I looked at Ted Olson, he and I were arguing the case on the same side and just kind of shook your head because that was generally the case. I don't know if it's going to happen with the town of Gilbert. I, I, I'm optimistic that they're going to determine that the, the ordinance is actually content-based. Because to determine if a statute is content-based, how about we start with read the statute. If it says it's ideological, it's treated this way. If it's directional, it's treated that way. If it's political, it's treated that way. Well, the determination is based on content. So what I think we have to go back to, and I'll wrap this up, is some first principles here. And, and we need a clarification, which I'm hoping we'll see in the Reed case. I'm not sure we will. I will still hope that we do, to clarify these areas. Because they intersect. They're, they're, they don't stand alone. The intersection of various First Amendment doctrines are real. It's complicated. And I will just close with this. The consequence of wrong decisions on First Amendment cases carry a heavy price. Thank you very much. So first, I'd just like to thank the editors of the Emory, of the Emory Law Journal uh, for just organizing this really, really wonderful symposium. Um, this panel is about freedom of speech in the 21st century. Um, and as we've heard, there are all sorts of you know, sort of many interesting substantive directions in which free speech doctrine could go, uh, particularly given things like the rise of social media, uh, the increased role of automated communications, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but what I'd like to talk about here is it touches on a broader question of how, generally speaking, a good First Amendment doctrine ought to be designed, um, particularly as it sort of confronts these sorts of unique and novel issues and questions in the coming years. Um, so my remarks today are going to focus on the value of what I call doctrinal transparency in First Amendment doctrine. Um, now, to establish what I mean by this, let's sort of just look at First Amendment doctrine at its most fundamental level. Um, so practically speaking, um, First Amendment doctrine is largely about the special value we attribute to speech, um, the social harms 
that are associated with speech and, and how we reconcile these. Uh, so in essence, you know, First Amendment doctrines basically designed to capture our basic intuitions as to what exactly makes speech constitutionally valuable uh, and how that value should be weighed against the sort of different types and degrees of social harm. Um, and these intuitions, and thus First Amendment doctrine in general, are driven by the sort of foundational rationales for extending special protection to speech. And these are, these are familiar ones that have been talked about. You know, the most prominent of these are the pursuit of truth, um, the promotion of democratic self-governance, um, autonomy interests, and so on and so forth. Now, that being said, we of course don't simply apply this sort of foundational ad hoc balancing in each individual First Amendment case. Um, we're worried about things like unchecked judicial discretion, uh, which can lead to unpredictable and inconsistent results, uh, which of course can lead to significant chilling effects. Um, so what we do is we adopt easier to apply categorical rules, which sacrifice the flexibility of sort of case by case balancing in favor of producing more consistent and predictable results. But of course, in order for a rule to really work, it has to adequately track our intuitions regarding sort of foundational questions of First Amendment value and harm. So this all leads me to this idea of doctrinal transparency. Um, doctrinal transparency can be viewed as sort of the opposite of abstract rule creation. Um, so I'm using this term to describe doctrine that encourages or even forces courts to analyze cases openly in a fashion that elicits direct discussion of these sort of foundational speech value and speech harm issues. Because although abstract rules are, are useful, they're of course only as good as the intuitions that underlie them. Um, when First Amendment doctrines transparent, um, courts are forced to sort of directly articulate and wrestle with these sort of foundational intuitions regarding speech value and speech harm. And that's exactly why doctrinal transparency is so valuable. Um, it acts as both a check on the rules that we've created, um, and it's also a means by which our fundamental intuitions, again, regarding speech value and harm, are going to continue to evolve and develop. So, in a way, this all sort of follows from the basic bedrock First Amendment principle that you know, open deliberation is sort of both the best means of arriving at truth and also a sort of essential, a, a, an essential requirement uh, for making reasoned, good collective decisions. Um, so encouraging sort of frank discussion of fundamental First Amendment values amongst courts and by extension among society at large I think creates the conditions, at least, under which good and coherent doctrine can emerge. So there's tremendous value, I think, to doctrinal transparency in the First Amendment context, but of course its value has to be measured against its costs, because again, we can't just adopt ad hoc balancing in every case. So the question is, under what doctrinal contexts can we sort of maximize the benefits of transparency while limiting any sort of associated costs? So with the remainder of my time, um, I want to focus on sort of two different areas of First Amendment doctrine that I think shed some light on this question. So the first is the court's recent establishment of a purely historical test for identifying categories of low value speech. Now, the court really first clarified this test in Stevens, which is the so-called Crush Videos case, uh, and there the basic issue was whether depictions of animal cruelty um, constituted unprotected low-value speech. And I think it's safe to say that the traditional understanding was that carving out categories of low-value speech, so these are things like obscenity or true threats or fraud, um, was accomplished by categorical balancing based on sort of the value and harm of the type of speech in question. Um, so this is pretty much a, this is a very transparent approach, okay? Close to fully transparent approach. But the Stevens Court rejected this view of low value speech. Um, it stated that the test is based solely on whether the category of speech is historically unprotected. It, in fact, went out of its way to disclaim any sort of balancing approach. So I don't like this rule, OK? I think it gives off a veneer of kind of objectivity and predictability. Um, but in reality, it, I don't think it offers much more predictability or consistency than the transparent balancing test that the Stevens Court rejected. 
Um, so, I mean, however strictly the court decides, uh, intends to apply this historical analysis, uh, the analysis must necessarily operate by analogical reasoning. Um, but of course, in applying this sort of reasoning, value judgments are inevitably come rushing back in. Um, so, I mean, to determine whether a category of novel speech uh, should be analogized to a historically excluded category of speech, first thing the court has to do is identify which particular characteristics of the historically excluded speech are sort of analytically significant. Um, the court then has to determine whether this new category of speech in question, which it can define sort of broadly or define narrowly, um, shares those key characteristics. But really, of course, the only analytically significant basis for identifying these sort of relevant characteristics is by looking at the speech's sort of social value as measured against its social costs. So this brings us right back to this sort of foundational balancing analysis. Um, and the court's judgment on this issue can sort of dictate the manner in which it conducts its historical analysis. So how it's going to characterize the speech or how broadly or narrowly it's going to draw analogies. So I think this historical rule often has little actual constraining effect in the hard cases where having a clear rule matters the most. At the same time, it can easily act as cover for what's in essence a basic value judgment, uh, again, regarding the value and harm of the speech category in question. So just to give a concrete example of this, let's look at the recent Alvarez case. So this is the case where the court struck down the Stolen Valor Act, which is a statute that criminalized lying about having received military medals. Now, at least at a broad level, the relevant history is perfectly clear. There's a long tradition of prescribing things like defamation, perjury, and fraud. All of these obviously involve false statements of fact. The plurality looks at this history and they say, well, sure, there are pockets of false statements of fact that were historically unprotected, but there's no historical basis for saying that false statements of fact in general are outside First Amendment protection. The dissent looks at the exact same history. The dissent says, well, the fact that we've long prescribed subsets like defamation, perjury, and fraud indicate a clear historical assumption that false statements of fact are unprotected speech. Uh, it just so happens that you know, we just decided to regulate in those areas, but it doesn't mean we couldn't have regulated more broadly. So what's really going on here? Um, I think it's really just a different value judgment regarding the speech in question. You know, underlying both the plurality and the Breyer concurrence, it's a sense that, the, that false statements of fact can have some inherent value, for example, as a way to avoid hurting people's feelings. Um, the dissent, however, makes perfectly clear that it attributes no inherent value to false statements of fact. So as I see it, a sort of purely historical test for low value speech um, sacrifices a transparent discussion of speech value and harm and all of the benefits that are sort of associated with that um, for little gain in predictability and consistency. Um, in other words, I think the, the test often works primarily to obscure the basic value judgments that are actually driving the analysis. Um, judgments that can, again, only be fully developed and fully scrutinized um, by laying them bare and discussing them frankly. Um, and I think it's particularly important to have these sorts of frank discussions when we're defining low value speech categories. I think, you know, no other inquiry and First Amendment doctrine really forces us to confront our foundational intuitions in the First Amendment in such a stark and direct manner. Um, so much so that I'd say that following these intuitions is to some extent inevitable regardless of what formal rule might apply. So I think if there's ever a place where courts should sort of transparently discuss foundational questions of speech value and speech harm, this is it. I think we'd be better off simply embracing a direct categorical balancing approach, uh, perhaps with some recognition that historical pedigree may matter as a factor to be taken into account, but this would at least bring everything out into the open, allow for a candid discussion about how we ought to value particular categories of speech as measured against their social harms. Now, the second doctrinal issue I'd like to discuss is a longstanding rule that content-based restrictions on speech are evaluated under strict scrutiny. And of course, as we all know, strict scrutiny in essence means invalidity. Um, now, this rule is crafted as a default rule. Uh, the court has carved out special categories of low value speech, like obscenity, for example, where a lower standard of review applies. 
Um, now, the default rule leads, I think, to significant issues of fit. You know, even when we exclude the recognized categories of low-value speech, uh, there's a strong intuition that not all remaining speech should be valued equally, and that the strict scrutiny default uh, may sometimes be too severe. Um, and I think this issue lingers in the background of the Alvarez case, where again, the speech in question was false statements of fact. So if we, let's assume both the plurality and Justice Breyer's uh, position that false statements of fact are not a historically unprotected category of speech, it also seems obvious to say that false statements of fact are not as valuable as, say, truthful political speech. Um, so the categorization question here is a tough one. Um, it's, a, it's an example of what I'll call middle ground speech that sort of sits somewhere in the hazy middle of the speech value spectrum between, say, sort of truthful political speech and true threats. Um, now, evaluating regulations of middle ground speech under the same onerous strict scrutiny standard that applies to, say, truthful political speech um, often creates a sort of tension with our fundamental intuitions about speech value and harm. And I'd say it's exactly in these sorts of hard middle ground speech categorization cases where the value of doctrinal transparency is maximized. Easy cases, so like, for example, credible threats to kill somebody, are easy precisely because we all agree how the sort of foundational balance shakes out. Um, so there's little to be gained by delving into these foundational value judgments. It's only in the hard cases where courts really have to face difficult line drawing questions that require a more nuanced view of why exactly we value speech and how we measure that against any of its associated harms. So in Alvarez, the plurality applies strict scrutiny. Justice Breyer cars out a new exception, applies intermediate scrutiny. That's what he would do. Um, now, if we're basing things on transparency benefits alone, then Justice Breyer's approach, I think, is the better one. Um, intermediate scrutiny is the only standard review that resembles actual balancing, right? It's the only inquiry where speech value and harm can be discussed, you know, sort of frankly and directly, at least without any sort of foreordained result. Um, but of course one could say, well, occasionally having to apply strict scrutiny in a case where strict scrutiny probably doesn't really fit, that might just be the price we pay for having rules that are more administrable, more predictable than sort of ad hoc balancing. Um, but I think there are significant practical risks to taking this approach in these cases. So rather than just simply apply strict scrutiny, courts might instead react by distorting the doctrine to reach what it feels like is the correct result. Um, so this might involve watering down the strict scrutiny standard. Uh, it might involve distorting the content-based, content-neutral inquiry, uh, and so forth. And I think one clear example of this is the, the secondary effects doctrine uh, that's been applied pretty much only in the so-called erogenous zoning cases. Um, and I think this sort of distortion is bad on many levels. Um, there's often no transparency in the analysis. Um, there's no explanation of the foundational value judgments that actually underlie the outcome of a case. Um, and it also produces negative long-term effects on future cases by sort of destabilizing and muddying doctrinal standards. So I think if we're looking for an approach that would sort of better capture the benefits of transparency um, while retaining the most substantial benefits of adopting categorical rules, Perhaps it might make the most sense for the court to simply embrace intermediate scrutiny rather than strict scrutiny as the default standard that applies to content-based restrictions on this kind of middle ground speech. Uh, so in other words, rather than just carve out low value speech and assume strict scrutiny applies to everything else, perhaps courts could also carve out the highest value speech, so perhaps political speech, artistic expression, and to explicitly set the default for any remaining uncategorized speech at intermediate scrutiny. So I think this makes potentially some practical sense because it's presumably easier to identify and sort of carve out categories of speech that reside at the sort of extremes of the speech value spectrum as opposed to identifying categories in the hazy middle. Um, and again, it's exactly in these difficult middle ground cases where the value of transparent sort of foundational First Amendment analysis is maximized. Um, and furthermore, where we set the default clearly matters because it's going to influence how courts approach their analysis. You know, if the default is intermediate scrutiny rather than strict scrutiny, 
um, then courts know that the path of least resistance leads to something that resembles at least a true balancing analysis as opposed to a severe and potentially ill-fitting rule of essentially automatic invalidation. So this will reduce their incentives to awkwardly shoehorn speech into ill-fitting categories or stretch doctrines, um, and it'll allow courts to work through issues sort of openly and transparently. Now, of course, there's always a trade-off when, when courts are given discretion particularly in the First Amendment context. Again, we lose predictability and consistency. Uh, this might lead to chilling effects. Um, but even in a highly rule-based regime, we always lose predictability and consistency in hard cases. Rules are fuzzy along the edges. Um, discretion always creeps in when it's unclear whether a given rule should apply. So since my, since my approach would focus solely on the hard cases in the middle, it may not actually cost too much in terms of loss of predictability or consistency. Um, and the gains from increased transparency are significant, because again, frank discussions of important foundational questions are much more likely to occur with more, when sort of more transparent analyses like intermediate scrutiny are involved, since there's far less doctrinal cover for courts to frame their decisions in sort of purely formal terms. Um, and in terms of doctrinal evolution, I think this may be a good thing. Um, we might think of intermediate scrutiny as kind of this analytical incubation zone for hard to classify categories of speech. Maybe it's a chance to debate the sort of relevant foundational questions, sort of frankly and openly, before eventually making a categorical decision. So uh, just a few thoughts uh, in closing. Uh, again, I think there's value in crafting doctrine that forces courts to discuss the underlying justifications of the First Amendment in a sort of frank and open manner, um, particularly in this era, again, of rapid social and cultural change, because it gives courts and society uh, a chance to deliberate and think through difficult foundational questions. On a concrete level, I think we can start to see some of the factors that might dictate where such doctrinal transparency is best deployed because we can't put it everywhere. Um, sometimes there are just rules that don't actually do much to constrain judicial discretion. Uh, and these rules can be dangerous because they might, they can easily be used as sort of Trojan horses that obscure the underlying value judgments that are actually driving the results. Um, and I think the purely historical test for low value speech, at least to the extent it's framed as purely historical, falls into this category. Um, now, in these sorts of cases, there's little benefit to offset the sort of associated loss of transparency, and it's best to design doctrine, I think, in a manner that's forthrightly transparent. Um, there may also be unique situations where transparent analysis is preferred simply because there isn't a workable rule that can act as a kind of useful proxy for the underlying value judgment. Um, and as I noted, I think this might be the case for identifying categories of low value speech. And I think a similar observation could be made for, say, evaluating content neutral speech regulations. Um, and finally, on a broad level, um, transparent analysis, I think, tends to be most valuable in hard cases precisely because, again, these are the cases that force courts to confront in a kind of nuanced manner these sort of foundational questions of speech value and speech harm. Um, so to the extent that we can sort of carve out and isolate these hard cases in a reliable way, um, I think First Amendment doctrine should be calibrated to ensure that these sort of valuable opportunities, again, to candidly explore these foundational questions um, are not wasted. So, so I'll close by saying, as First Amendment doctrine continues to evolve in the coming century, um, courts should keep in mind the sort of value of doctrinal transparency as a sort of counterweight to the drive to develop simple abstract rules to govern novel speech issues. Because um, again, these rules are only as good as our intuitions of speech value and speech harm that underlie them. Um, and the best way, I think, to develop and sharpen these intuitions uh, is by embracing you know, frank and open debate regarding them whenever hard cases arise. Thanks so much. Religious rights, 
may be opportunistically described, uh, de defined as speech rights and sort of equal protection, I think those clashes will come, arise more frequently and may eventually find their way up. So I think that's one category of case that, that there'll be a lot of them. I, I, I've got one which is, um, in my own area, which is the questions of tension between um, intellectual property and the First Amendment, is that the Ninth Circuit has a pair of dueling cases that come to precisely opposite results, um, the uh, video game uh, right of publicity and trademark games. Um, and they're simply not reconcilable as a matter of principle or as a matter of thinking about it. And so um, there's a petition for a hearing on Bonk. My great hope is that we'll actually get the one that I think is wrongly decided on right of publicity, um, that the Ninth Circuit will stick to its guns and that we'll have the Supreme Court take cert on it because we haven't had a good right of publicity since the 1970s with the um, human cannonball case. But really I think what it is, is one of the things that we talked about today is the power of analogy to drive decisions and the need, as Jay pointed out, to actually get beneath that and uh, as David pointed out as well, to sort of grapple with the principles at stake. And one of the things that I hope that we can get beyond is the simple clash of free speech versus property rights, which is a sort of simplistic way to characterize it, and to think more deeply about the sort of needs that drive both doctrines. I'll just throw in for uh, cases that are like, we're not done, I think, with false statements of fact. Um, there, you know, there's going to be election, there are election fraud cases and stuff like that that are coming up. So, um, so I think that's an area where there's going to be a lot of confusion and development in the coming years. And more questions? Okay, great. All right. Let's have a final round of applause for our excellent panel. Yeah, excellent. Very good. Good seeing you. Students are lucky. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's symposium. I think we've had a really wonderful experience here of every possible angle and opinion from the ways that we can make free speech work to the idea of overhauling the entire system as is. I encourage you all to join us to continue talking over food and drinks in the auditorium, but thank you again for attending and making this year's symposium such a great success. Thank you.